All right. All right. Here it comes. We're doing it. We're making it happen. Let's make sure this thing is working. There it is. That's the notification we were looking for. That's the one. That's the peach right there. We're looking at uh, roughly a 20 second delay uh, between me recording this thing and uh, and it popping up. So here we go, since we're live. Welcome to that awkward moment <laughs> where I do all my shares. <laughs> and you guys have to kind of watch me share this everywhere. It's a new song. Just made up. Probably going to be a number one hit single soon. Uh, but welcome, welcome, welcome! If you are tuning in, to hang in there. Uh, get your get yourself a get yourself a drink. I got my tea. I got my water. Uh, but we're gonna we're gonna talk about we're gonna talk about old Joey Beads. Uh, but I'm gonna do a couple shares. Put this out there to a few groups, to a few uh, people. Invite a few people that I know will tune into this thing. Drop a couple links in the comments section, and uh, and then we will we will jump right in. Jump right into into the shit. Uh, so if you if you would like to, one of the things you can do is also share this out to a uh, on your on your social feeds or your groups that that uh, that you're part of. You could do that. That'd be rad. That would be super super helpful uh, to to me, um, and it would make this this weird thing that I do at the very top of these shows, uh, slightly less awkward. So give me, <clears throat> and usually these things take like between five and eight minutes for me to do is sort of the, the running tally. Um, so if you can, uh, do that. Another thing that you could do too is, uh, I usually do a check-in at the top of the show about where, 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 where I'm at, uh, mentally and physically. Um, because I think, I think, we should do that, right? We should be honest with ourselves and be honest with the with the people around us, and maybe they'll they'd be honest uh, back to you as well. So, um, yeah, if you can leave a comment about uh, what's going on with you, how you're doing, uh, and then we'll read it together, and we'll uh, we'll we'll lift each other up and do all that good, positive, exciting, fun stuff that uh, <laughs> that we do. So, uh, yeah, those are a couple things that you can do while I'm sharing and inviting some folks to uh, come join the old live stream. I know this is late. I know I said I'd start at 3 o'clock. Uh, if, you, if you follow the event, I know I said 3 o'clock. It is almost 4. Uh, and there's a good reason for that, and I will get to that in just a moment. So... <laughs> uh, if you want to give me a moment, I will, uh, I will jump into that. Um, and uh, and and we will have a, a weird, interesting time talking about the old the old Joey B's, the old Bidens. Okay, I got two more groups I can share this out to. And then I got to stop because um, if uh, if I share it out to too many groups, Facebook questions my reality, whether I'm a real human or not. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't, I don't fucking need that. <laughs> and I don't, I don't need my goddamn reality to be questioned, you know, not by Facebook, not by, not by Facebook. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a real, I'm a real boy. I know I'm a real boy. I don't need Facebook to question that reality for me. Son of a bitch. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna post a few links. Uh, I got a new album coming out, so you can uh, you can check that out. That'd be rad if you if you want to pre-order it. It's a dollar. Uh, I'm doing these virtual stand-up shows that I'm gonna be talking about uh, as well. Their uh, tickets are available for all of the June shows right now. And uh, if you want this, this is a way that you get all of these things all at once. Uh, which is becoming a sustaining member, making a donation, things of that sort. So that is also an availability to you uh, in this 
in this moment. So uh, our final little thing, let's invite a few people. By the way, I think you guys can do that too. There's a little thing on the side that uh, lets you invite folks um, to, the, uh, to the live stream here. Uh, so if you would like to, you can totally 100% do that. And that would be awesome. Uh, that would be, again, pretty, pretty darn helpful to me uh, in this this moment uh well and it would it'll it'll make this sort of weird transitionary part seem less weird and transitionary um i'm gonna try to invite some folks that i know that tune into these things but up but up but up but up Some people that I know will tune into this thing. Do 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 do. Let's see. All right, I'm almost done here, and then we will. We will dive into things. We will make the things happen. Thank you guys for, for hanging in there and being patient. Uh, pretty cool of you guys to do that. I appreciate it. Okay. Who else do I know that normally tunes into this? <laughs> All right, so the last of the few folks to invite here. Okay. All right. I think we're ready. I think we're ready to do this. I think you're ready. Okay. Uh, a couple of you have already let comments happen. Uh, Jay Jackson, yo, wait, hold the fuck up. Where did you cut your hair? I, uh, it, this just happened, Jay. Uh, the hair just, it's just, this is what happens now in the quarantine is you just wake up and one day it's all gone. Uh, no, I have a, I have a friend. Um, uh, she, uh, she is, uh, doing, doing, doing some cuts, um, uh, by, uh, um, referrals. She was actually my old housemate and, uh, she came over, wore masks uh, super safe about everything. It was pretty rad. She, she did a great job and I kind of needed it because it was, it was starting to get to the point where like every year about every, every, I would say between like 12 and 18 months, I have to get a haircut because it just gets long and kind of unmanageable. Um, so, uh, and you know, again, it was like, I asked her if she was still doing it. And then she said, yes. Um, had she said, no, I would have just dealt with it. You know what I mean? Or I would have figured out how to botch my own haircut, which would have 100% been a thing that would have happened. <laughs> I would have definitely botched my own haircut. Um, but yeah, it, it, I, I, uh, uh, I, I trimmed the old dome. Uh, feels pretty nice. Went for a walk yesterday and today. Uh, and, uh, and it's nice because like, I can actually still feel the breeze like going into like through my hair and stuff. Uh, that was pretty cool. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, I got a, I got a haircut. Thanks for noticing Jay. I appreciate it. Uh, hello, Dolores. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. It's very nice of you. Um, guys, I don't know if you can tell, uh, so to, to dive into our check-in here today, uh, I'm doing, I'm, I'm in a pretty, uh, good goddamn mood, uh, to be honest, as I drop things off of my desk, I'm trying to subtly move things around in my desk and it's not working out great. Uh, but I'm in a pretty good goddamn mood, uh, despite the fact that my desk is a clutter. Um, the show, uh, I did, the, the yesterday show, the Citizen Revolution show, went spectacularly, by the way. Uh, it was awesome. Uh, we had about 20 people in the showroom. Uh, everybody, uh, I think everybody had a good time. Uh, they, everybody tells me they had a good time. Uh, there's one particular bit that uh, I will be posting 
in the in the next uh, next week or so um that i will uh that, that kind of became the became like a big hit that i didn't think was going to become as big of a hit uh but here's the cool part about these shows you guys is i've got people like all across the country that regularly come out to see me and uh and they've and they've come to boat shows we had some repeat people we had some new people and uh and it's really really fucking cool to see all of them in like one kind of virtual space kind of interacting with each other you know because there's people from like uh people from from norfolk that are part of the the skeptic and the dsa community meeting people from the green party committee in 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 greenville and people in in chattanooga it's, it's like lansing and chicago all kind of coming together and chatting in the little rooms it's cool it it it, it kind of it gives me a little warm feeling in my heart um and it was super rad that uh you know everybody um everybody's hanging out and they were they all had a good time together uh take i'm doing them again in june they're coming back in june uh every single friday in june 9 p.m eastern uh if you want tickets there is a link to get tickets in the comments uh as well as in the description of the show itself um and uh you can grab them right now they're five bucks they're five bucks minimum uh, it's one per household. You don't need to buy multiple tickets for having multiple people since we're kind of in a in a weird, different digital age. Um, and this is essentially uh, how I'm going to be doing performances at this point. And it's also how I'm going to be earning a bulk of my income at this point as well. Uh, sustaining members get free tickets. So if you would like to, you can become a sustaining member and, uh, and get free tickets. You can also get a, a free early bird copy of my album. That is also something that sustaining members get. Uh, my album is available to pre-order for a dollar. Uh, and I'm trying to keep these prices relatively reasonable um, so that everybody can kind of get them regardless of, of what your financial situation is. And if your financial situation is particularly precarious, please feel free to send me a message or email uh, and I will get you a ticket to the al uh, ticket to the these virtual comedy shows. Um, and I will get you a copy of the album as well. Uh, the other thing with the virtual comedy shows, too, is it's different material every single time. Um, there's going to be a couple of, like, flagship bits that I do each and every time, but those will probably change and get tweaked up uh, as we go along as well. Uh, but but it's a different show. Different. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do themes and segments to these shows. That's sort of the way that uh, I, I started writing them. <clears throat> so uh, And I'm having a really fun time doing that. I'm having a really fun time writing it that way. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, I, yeah, so I'm, I'm just like in a pretty, pretty great mood, uh, just in, in terms of that, like the show went really fucking well. Um, the only thing I'm, I'm kind of missing right now is, you know, the after party from the shows, you know, going out and, and having a drink with people and, and sitting around bullshitting and, uh, you know, that, that sort of stuff. Like I do, I do miss that aspect of, of live performance. Um, but the other reason uh, that that I'm also in a pretty pretty damn good mood here is um, I, uh, I I ordered some pins like those little pins that you put on your shirts and stuff uh, from a, from a great Pittsburgh man called Old Game. If you're unfamiliar with Old Game, uh, you probably hear them every time you watch one of my videos. Uh, that I post up because their their song Blue from their album Lunatics is the theme song right now, uh, the opening theme song to to my uh, to my videos. So um, yeah, so they they dropped off some pins which I have here. They're in this adorable little bag. Like, but well, I don't do this sort of stuff, by the way. Like, I'm so terrible at packaging. Like, I'm just like, here's a fucking CD or whatever. <laughs> And I just kind of whip it at you like a frisbee. Like this is adorable. They have all of it like in this little thing. There's four different pins in here. They put a little card in there as well with their with their website, oldgamemusic.com. If you want to go and grab yourself an album, if you want to go grab yourself some pins and things. And they came over. We we got the masks on and everything, and we we did the social distancing thing. Got these pins, and on top of that, dude, I got a personalized card. They wrote a personalized card for me. Like this is, this is like the cutest thing in the world right now. So uh, I was waiting for that to come through, and they're hand delivering all this stuff. 
uh, and I kind of live in the burbs of the of, of Pittsburgh right now. So, uh, which which if you're unfamiliar with Pittsburgh, that means crossing a bridge uh, and crossing a, a a bridge and a tunnel, uh, which to Pittsburghers is like a fucking nightmare. They're just like, oh my god, what if the bridge? explodes and sets on fire and there's like a dragon that comes up out of the river what if it's a river dragon that comes out so everybody just drives real slow uh what if the mountain collapses in on itself what if the nature takes itself back <laughs> uh, so you know i really appreciate that they dropped this off this was really fucking cool so i had to wait for that to come in uh so overall super good mood uh a little sweaty already because i have to shut my door and turn on my fan uh, to do these videos now, and it's starting to get a little warmer in the room. So uh, if you if you see some pit stains or me starting to get a little sweaty, uh, just I'm 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 literally hot boxing you guys. But that is our check-in uh, for the day. I'm doing really well, and we we only got one main story to cover today, um, as you can as you can tell from the description of the show here. Um, and, and it's going to be, a, it's going to be a bit of a doozy. Uh, so I'm going to get all my, all my chicanery ready, uh, to ready to rock and roll here. And we're going to dive into this story. So without any further ado, let's get into Biden's breakfast club bungle. You guys, this has been going around all over the internet. Um, uh, the, uh, it's, it's really only the, the people are kind of focusing on, um, the last 30 seconds of this video. So I wanted to go through the whole fucking thing because the whole fucking thing is crazy, right? It's like an 18 minute interview and we're, uh, and I, and I wanted to watch it all, uh, with you guys and kind of do some commentary in between. Um, so here's what I'm going to ask you guys while we're watching this, you guys can leave comments and I encourage you guys to leave comments because intermittently I'm going to, I'm going to stop and come back and read your comments and respond to them as we do, uh, during these live streams. Uh, while we're watching the video, I probably won't be looking at the comments too much, but I do have some spots where I will stop. We'll come back, read some comments and go right back into the video. So I encourage you guys to leave some comments. Uh, be cool to, if, if you guys are responding to each other in the comment section, uh, be good to each other. Don't be dicks. Be respectful to each other. Everybody has their opinions, their beliefs. Uh, some people might be pro-Biden. Some people might be anti-Biden. Some people might be anti-Biden, but still choose to vote for him so we got to be respectful to each other uh and um everybody has their reasons for making the decision that they do but the goal here is to look at sort of the accuracy of what actually happened in these interview in in, in this interview right so um uh biden went on the breakfast club with charlemagne de god uh not super familiar with charlemagne if uh, my, myself, uh, I'm I'm unfamiliar with it. I want to say Joe Biden's kind of unfamiliar with Charlemagne. <laughs> I gotta say, I think Joe Biden's probably unfamiliar with Charlemagne as well. And like I said, this thing has been going around the internet um, for you know, fucking the, the the last day and a half that's all that's all people have been talking about is is the last 30 seconds of this interview and the last 30 seconds of this interview were bad but the whole fucking thing is pretty terrible you guys so i wanted to kind of dive into how terrible this whole this whole thing is all right so we're gonna watch this thing if you if if you guys can't hear it um leave a comment leave a comment if you can't hear it i'll i'll run it for a bit and then I'll come back and check on that. Um, and, and here we go. Wake that ass up uh, in the morning. The breakfast club. This is the greatest introduction of all time. You guys wake that ass. That's the best introduction. I feel like, uh, I feel like all that's just, I don't think any other show has ever had a better introduction than <laughs> this right here. So, okay, let's keep going. President Biden, how are you today? Good. Good to see you. Same here. You know, you know, I've been critical of you. Um, I, I have a few things I want to talk to you about. Today. I know you have. Yeah. You don't know me. No, I don't. That's why I want to get to know you today. I want to get to know you today. Um, I want to talk to you about mostly black stuff. But, you know, first of all, how are you? How's your family during this quarantine? Thank God everybody's doing well. How about you and your family? Man, we over here blessed black and highly favored, man. Well, I tell you what, the black community is getting killed, though. That is very, very true. That is very true. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> Charlemagne's trying to keep it light. You know, he's like, hey, how's it going? How are you doing? How's your family? And <laughs> immediately Biden's just like, hey, black people are dying. Do you know that? Do you, are you aware? It's just like, yep. Yeah, we know, Joe. We're, I'm just trying to get through the pleasantries. Like, I like how you how immediately he turns the pleasantries into a death toll. Thirty seconds into this interview, thirty seconds into this interview, he just turned it into a death toll. Like, look, I perform like very long form essayistic uh, comedy that talks about like these really dark, depressing issues and shit. And and um and I do and I do have some dark jokes in my in my set. But you got to ease people into it. You can't just go right in, right? You got to ease people into some of the darkness. And uh, and Joe Biden was just like, yeah, no, we're not. I'm just going to go. Black people are dying. You, are you aware, Charlemagne? <laughs> just like, yeah, man. Just to maybe I'm good is all we need. And then we can start this interview where, where the interview needs to start. Oh, man. He's just a... Uh, I mean, here's the thing. It's like he's not wrong, right? There is a disproportionate amount of death uh, within the within communities of color, uh, and I am going to talk about that uh, later in this video as as well. But that, that that is just like the dude's just trying to be nice and get through like your pleasantries, and he was like, "Death, how about that? You want to just jump right in?" It's like maybe give it a minute. Um. You know, it's a, it's a lot of right wing media outlets. They they question you. They question your cognitive health. They don't they don't think <laughs> they don't think everything's working upstairs. What what do you say to that? I say I can hardly wait to meet with that guy who is the stable genius. <laughs> There's nothing stable about that guy. <laughs> yeah, I I don't think either of them are stable. Like neither one of them are stable. Like Donald Trump is not stable. And once we start watching this interview. Uh, the deeper we go into this interview, the more we can see that Joe Biden is super fucking not stable, which I don't think is like if you regularly watch my videos like that is not a surprising statement. Like if you're a first time viewer of this video, this might be like, oh, OK, cool. either you agree with me or or you don't. But, you know, like I've been saying this for a long time. It's like Biden is not stable, but neither is Trump. Right. Like Trump is not a stable individual either. Like. There's an interview that uh, on, on the Joe Rogan podcast with uh, with journalist Matt Taibbi, uh, who is a great journalist. I highly recommend his work. He writes for the Rolling Stone right now, and he does a podcast called Useful Idiots with Katie Halper. And uh, he talks about how like Trump might be doing amphetamines, and and that's that's like that's when you get the most bombastic versions of Trump. Um, so I I kind of think that's true. I kind of think the reason why Trump doesn't like he babbles in a different way, you know, like Joe Biden has difficulty getting thoughts out. Um, and there are several reasons. I think I think he's he's ha he has a really hard time of like really learning how to filter himself. Um, but with Trump, it's just like the other, he just babbles and lets it all out. So it's just there's no control over what they're doing. Uh, so neither one of them is <laughs> are stable people. So, all right, let's. Uh, I'm gonna double check to make sure this is okay. Yeah, this is still coming through. All right, here we go. This is a bit of bit. bit we're gonna let it run for a bit more. You know, one, one one thing I've been critical about is I feel like you've been like MIA during this global pandemic. You know, it's people like Governor Cuomo here in New York who have become political stars simply because we see and hear from them every day. So I'm just, I'm just like, how I'm, I'm wondering how you're going to energize people and win a campaign from the house. Well, I tell you what I'm doing. I'm, I'm following the rules, man. True. Number one, I'm keeping the rules. My governor says he doesn't want us out. I haven't been out. I wear my mask. I have a mask. I got secret service outside. I walk outside. I have it on. They get tested. And by the way, I'm beating them across the board. Mm -hmm. Of 160 million people have watched me so far on shows like yours. Okay. All the stuff about it hurting me. It's not hurting me. I'm winning in all those states. I'm ahead in all national polls. And uh, the more he talks, the better off I am. Yeah, we, we know polls, polls can be illusions, though. Like, you know, we, we looked at all the polls in 2016, too, and look what happened. Totally different, man. 2016 is totally different. What you had then is you had somebody who didn't, they didn't know it all. They wanted to just change the system the way it was. 
He was the biggest change. He had no serious opposition that turned out to materialize. And uh, so it's totally different. Right now, we're in a situation where it's like, you know, that Carney show goes through town once and you find out there's no pee under any one of those three shells that get pushed around. Mm -hmm. Next time it comes back, what do you do? Next time it comes back, you ain't playing. You got to figure it out. Okay. And let me tell you something. My community figured it out a while ago. But here's... <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure his community is, uh, is the donor class. And the reason why the donor class hates Donald Trump is because... Donald Trump exposes everything corrupt about the donor class. That's why they don't fucking like Trump. You know, uh, all of their secrets are exposed with this guy. Again, the, the guy, the dude doesn't have a fucking filter. So he just goes off and spouts some crazy bullshit. You know, it's like, oh, he heard some quote and then he doesn't understand what the quote is. And then he just blurts it out into a speech. It's just like, what the fuck is happening? Um, I'm not saying I'm, I'm not making an excuse for it. I'm saying that's what it is. That's that that's sort of the way that Donald Trump operates. Is it's and we know that about him, and that's why that's that's why the donor class doesn't like him. He's too bombastic as an individual. Now he talks about polls, uh, right? He's he's beating Donald Trump in all these polls all over the place. And Charlemagne points out that the polls could be skewed. The polls can be can come off. Uh, um, uh, you know, all, all the polls kept saying that Hillary was going to win. And then and then look what happened. Um, you know, so so where's the fervor and the excitement? But here's the here. Here's the interesting thing. Right. Is Joe Biden's talking about polls all of a sudden is every single poll, every single poll during the primary said that Bernie could beat Trump. I mean, there was virtually no poll when that 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 they ran that that didn't show Bernie not beating Trump. Right. Bernie was beating Trump through and through in all these polls and the media fucking ignored it. Joe Biden ignored it. The pr everybody that was covering the primary, except for like the, the more progressive channels, the alternative channels that kind of get censored a whole lot. Like corporate media didn't cover that fucking at all. Um, he also does uh, point out that uh, because 2016 was different, that Trump is a reaction. Trump is a reaction to, uh, to the status quo that was in place. And that status quo is what Joe Biden represents. So he acknowledges that it's a reaction to the status quo, which is what Joe Biden is. And it's just like he doesn't put the pieces together. Or maybe he does put the pieces together and he's not going to fucking say it. Uh, he meant, uh, Charlemagne mentioned Andrew Cuomo. Uh, Andrew Cuomo is a corporate shill. He is, you know, he's not somebody that, that everybody should be should be championing the way that they do. There are, a lot of people are kind of fawning over Andrew Cuomo right now. And the dude's a corporate shill that destroyed Medicaid in the state of New York. He cut it by $900 billion. Uh, he cut hospital beds because they were unused, right? Like unused right before a global pandemic. Um, and, and that's what happens in a profit-driven um, uh, healthcare system is, is you look at beds and you go, well, we have this for this X, Y, Z situation, but we're not in an X, Y, Z situation. So let's just get rid of them. Um, and then once you're in the X, Y, Z situation, he, you do what Andrew Cuomo does where you complain, Oh, there's these beds are gone. And look at these nurses. And like most nurses that I've heard interviews from, uh, are, are basically like you, you fucked us. You put us in this situation and now you're, now you're trying to capitalize on, on that. Now you're flipping your position. Um, he he basically cut he did that he cut medicaid to balance the books but he balanced the books in order to make sure that rich people don't have to pay taxes in the state of new york so that they keep coming and owning vacation homes in the finger lakes right like that's basically what he did but he can put a coherent sentence together and he sounds mildly professional and everybody is like, oh, my God, this guy is like a uh, like our savior. He's a God amongst men. It's like you can put you can string a fucking sentence together with like a noun and a verb and maybe a couple adjectives. And everybody is just like, this guy's incredible. Like, where are we as a society when when just basic sentence structure is something that we have to tout as this incredible, amazing over the top thing that that these people are, are 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 champions in our society just because they can string a fucking sentence together is the bar really that fucking low well i guess with joe biden being the presidential nominee on the democratic side it kind of is it kind of is you know 
what's the, the real problem is is like i we just don't know what real leadership looks like in this country right like we have we have people like joe biden and andrew cuomo those are our examples of of what real leadership looks like um, or or what we perceive real leadership to look like every time a real leader steps up every time a leader that is willing to fight for the working class steps up uh they end up getting killed by the intelligence community in the donor class. <laughs> they automatically get assassinated. That's what happens. So then people just latch on to these, you know, minor celebrity politicians that end up becoming the flavor of the campaign for a while. And, and then everybody goes, look at how great he is. He said the day of the week and he wasn't confused about it. And it's just like, <laughs> great. <laughs> That's it. What about his policies? It doesn't matter. He says sentence is real nice. It's, it's kind of sad and upsetting. Anyway, as we continue. Here's the deal. What I have to do is I have to continue to talk about the things that matter. And the things that matter are, for example, right now there's a study out of Columbia University and the disease control center up there. They pointed out that if he had listened to me and others and acted just one week earlier to deal with this virus, there'd be 36,000 fewer people dead, dead, dead. And you guys are wondering, what are we, what's he doing? Come on, man, get a life, get a life. This guy has been. Okay, he sounds real stable here, right? Dead, dead, dead. Like this is, this is the, 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 the the definition of stability here. <laughs> he just sounds like this angry old white dude. Do you guys remember how everybody used to shit on Bernie Sanders for sounding like an angry old white dude? Like every single time that they went on corporate media, nobody could really touch his policies. Nobody could really touch the ideas, but they would be like, well, you know, he's just, he's just, just kind of like this angry old man, you know, he's just kind of, he's just up there and he's saying these, uh, saying these things and he's just, he's just angry, you know, where, where, where are all those people now with, with him? Look at that image right there. Does that look like somebody that is calm, that knows how to express their emotions in a way where people can understand what that is? Or does it just sounds like he's outpouring all of this shit, you know? Where Where is the media addressing this? Where is corporate media addressing this? Where the fuck is Claire McCaskill getting on MSNBC talking about how Joe Biden just just yelled the word dead three times at a black man? <laughs> where, where's the media report on that? You, you won't fucking see it, folks. You won't fucking see it. Let's continue down the rantings of this old man. Incredibly terrible. And what, what we've had is, you know, back in... When uh, in January, I said I wrote an article back, I think, on 27th of January, said this pandemic's here. We should act. Every other country that was acted around the time, got, got the notice around the time we did, they have considerably fewer deaths as a percent of the population. I'm the guy that said we ought to take hard records and find out exactly how many people in the black community are getting COVID and are dying from it. And look what's happened. Now everybody's going, oh, surprise, surprise. Look, everybody knows this. We have to come back. We have to fight back. And, you know, the crisis lays laying bare the institutional racism that's still prevalent in our society. And I believe we have to address it by transforming our economy and this time bringing everybody along. And we haven't, look, he started to undermine the pillars of his economy before. But look, the blinders, Charlemagne, might have been taken off. Okay. Now people recognize that those essential workers, a disproportionate amount of them are African Americans and they're breaking their necks, risking their lives, losing their lives. They're grocery store workers, they're bus drivers, they're delivery people, they're the people who are on the line. They are the, they're, they're he they're the healthcare workers who are in a position where they're taking care of the nurses. I mean, and, and they're making basically the minimum wage. So this time when we come back, if we had not only rebuild, move this along, we not only rebuild, but we have to transform this economy. We can create millions of new jobs in transportation, energy structure. We can, there's jobs, a, a job is a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. It's about respect. It's about how you treat it. It's about having purpose 
in your life. It's about creating an economic system that would do that. Right. And we've talked about this uh, on on this channel and these videos is that universal basic income would be a way that you would be able to do that. And I've made a lot of different arguments about that. Um, and there are several videos that you can go watch where, where I talk about why universal basic income would do exactly what Joe Biden's talking about, where where, where your job becomes about me finding meaning and purpose and respect and dignity. And a job is just more about the, more more than just doing a job. But uh Joe Biden would never approve something like universal basic income. Joe Biden would never uh, approve something like Medicare for all. In fact, he said so. He has straight up said that if Medicare for all comes to his desk, he will veto it. Now, these are all very nice things, right? And Charlemagne talked about how he disappeared during this crisis. And he did. I think there was a couple of weeks where he just like, like nobody knew where he was. Uh, and I think his team was like, we're trying to figure out how to make the things work. And it's just like, dude, I figured out I'm a fucking nobody that doesn't have a team to do shit. And I figured out a bunch of shit. Like I figured out how to do live streams from my bedroom. Like that's, you know, it's like, it's not, I'm sure there's somebody on your team that can set some shit up for you. And I'm sure Joe Biden has a far larger budget than I do to do it. Right. And I'm a fucking nothing and a nobody somewhere in, in, you know, in the uh, Western side of Pennsylvania to figure this shit out. And there's tons of other comedians that did the same thing. <laughs> and, and these are all very nice things that Joe Biden is saying. They're all very nice things that Joe Biden is saying, but that's all they are. It's just words that he says because he might have read them in an article or, or something along those lines, or his team has has said, this is the angle you should take in interviews. Uh, but he hasn't done dick all to make any of this stuff happen on a legislative level. He hasn't, he hasn't done that at all. He hasn't pushed any sort of legislative change to transform, uh, transform the nature of jobs. He hasn't, he hasn't supported the strikes. He hasn't supported any of the worker strikes that are going on out there. He has he he hasn't a, a pushed back against people like Jeff Bezos, the Waltons, Bill Gates, Tim Cook. None of those people. All of the like all these companies, the CEO of Instacart, he hasn't pushed back on any of that. And he sure as shit hasn't gone up to his Republican buddies because he talks about unity and reaching across the aisle and, and making compromises. Well, yeah, he makes compromises for corporations all the time, but he doesn't make any compromise for the average American voter. He doesn't make any compromise for you or me. Right. It's just not a thing that he does. Right. It is not a thing that he does. And, you know. That's part of the problem is you can say a lot of really nice things and a lot of politicians do, but if they're not going to put any legislative backing behind it, why would we support any of their ideas? It's kind of the way that I've used this. It's, it's a lot of platitudes and he's saying some very nice things and he's saying some things that I listened to this interview and I was like, yeah, a lot of the things you're saying are, yeah, I'm, I, I got you, but you ain't putting any action behind it. That's not what your record shows. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's how we built the from the working class to the middle class. But this time we have to address the institutional racism. We've seen it more clearly now. In a, in a black majority mm -hmm. county, they're six times more likely to die in a pandemic than a white county. They're disproportionately uninsured in the African-American community, disproportionately make up the essential jobs that that they can't do at home. They're risking their lives every day. Enough's enough. And this Biden recovery I'm gonna to put together will bring everybody along. I'm gonna build a better, a better future, not back to what we had, but a better, back to something better than we had. I wanna I wanna reiterate what he just said. Back to something better than what we had. Again. Remember how he claims that he is mentally stable? What he just said doesn't make any sense. If that's the thing that they're running at, back to something better than what we had. It doesn't make any sense. You just, it, you, you might as well come out and just be like, time is a flat disc. That's my economic plan. Time is a flat disc. That's how we're going to move forward. Biden 2020, time is a flat disc. All of my plans, time is a flat disc. That's, Back to something better than what we had. What? It doesn't make any sense. 
and, I, and but he's but he's in this like ranty raid spiral about this stuff because Charlemagne questioned his record. He questioned the fact that Joe Biden disappeared. Joe Biden disappeared, and nobody knew where he went. And Joe Biden doesn't really seem to have a plan on how he would attack the pandemic, what he would have done. He just says a bunch of shit about like, well, look at the things that Trump didn't do. Where the fuck were you? Where the fuck? You're a senator. Joe, like, the, what legislations were you putting forward? Where were you talking to Mitch McConnell? I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. Um, I don't know if you saw a couple weeks ago, um, Sean Combs, you might you might know him as Diddy. Diddy, yeah. You know, he, he said what I believe a lot of black voters, including myself, feel, and that's that Democrats take black voters for granted. You know, um, votes are quid pro quo, right? It's not like I don't want to vote. I just want to know what candidates will do for us in exchange for our votes. The same way young progressive Latinos or uh, the LGBT community. Absolutely. Candidates, we want the same thing. Do you feel like black people are owed that from the Democratic Party? Absolutely, Bob. What would I say? Remember when I said Biden can't win? The primaries. Yes. I kicked everybody's out. I excuse me. It I don't won. talk like that. I need you to say that. You did no, what? No. I won overwhelmingly. I told you when I got to South Carolina, I won every single county. I won a larger share of the black vote than anybody has, including Barack. I <laughs> <laughs> including Barack, you guys. All right. That's right. Joe Biden just made a weird brag about how he might be blacker than Barack. <laughs> Just like black people like me better than the first black president. Come on, baby. I beat that black dude. <laughs> like, what? Oh, man. Great still, I got to say. I, um, not, to, not, not to do a weird brag on myself there, but that's a fucking great still, isn't it? Uh, all right. Increase the vote in Virginia overwhelmingly by 70%. Look. What people don't know about me is I come from a state as the eighth largest black population in America, the eighth largest. I get 96% of that vote for the last 40 years. It's, they're, they're the folks, as they say it my way, brung me to the dance. That's how I get elected every single time. And everybody's shocked. I get overwhelming support from the black leadership, young and old. Every poll shows me way ahead. And it's not just, I hear this, oh yeah, old blacks are with Biden, but young aren't. Look at the polling data. Polling data, let's say it's off by half. Come on, man. Give me a little break here. Yes, everybody. We have to, we have to give Joe Biden a break. We got to cut this guy some slack. You know, he's, he is struggling out there in his multi-million dollar boomer cave with 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 his his secret service all around him and and the and the access to to federally covered health care and testing and treatment that he's getting look it has been weeks weeks since joe biden has been able to cut medicare for all for people weeks till he could look at a poor person in the play in the face and say he is not going to give them health care gotta cut him some slack you guys uh but <laughs> before we keep going i, I do want to take a look at um uh, look at some of these comments. <laughs> we got a few. Uh, Andrew Edelman. Uh, I don't think I could ever have the knowledge of hospital management that you see. Andrew, I'm getting that information from a few uh, interviews that I've seen on some progressive channels, progressive news outlets uh, over the last two months. Uh, they have interviewed hospital workers, nurses, doctors, uh, researchers, and hospital staff themselves. Uh, Democracy Now! has had a couple of them. And I'm, I'm on and off uh, on that show, um, uh, I, but that's where I am uh, getting uh, the information from. But that's all I have, right? I, I've, I don't personally know a whole lot of nurses or doctors that are currently working, or if I do, I've, uh, I did, I've, I've missed them, unfortunately. Um, so that's where I'm getting that information from. But from, from what it seems like is a lot of people don't like Andrew Cuomo uh, because he cut Medicare, for, be, be, Medicaid. He cut, he cut Medicaid and he cut hospital beds, uh, which is a pretty, pretty shit thing to do, in my opinion, especially, especially at the time of a, a global pandemic. Um, intelligence community gets harassed on by a lot of our presidents in history. Uh, that's why when briefing Trump mean, <laughs> mean bring, bring a coloring book and an extra set of crayons. 
Uh, sometimes it depends. I don't know. I feel like there's been a lot of presidents that have worked pretty much in tandem with the intelligence community. Uh, Obama worked very closely with the intelligence community. That's what Edward Snowden revealed. The NSA was spying on them, and, the, and he expanded the uh, surveillance program uh, uh, under there. We, we definitely know that the Bush administration was working with the intelligence community. Uh, that's basically what the whole uh, debacle with the uh, Iraq was. Uh, the Daddy Bush was definitely working with the intelligence community. That dude was... Um, that dude was uh, the director of the CIA before he became the VP to Reagan and then became the president of the United States. Clinton was probably also working pretty closely with the intelligence community. Um, and to your point, <laughs> that's why when briefing Trump um, uh, mean bring a coloring book to, and an extra set of crayons, uh, I think Trump kind of listens to Pompeo now. If you, if you remember... Um, Pompeo was the director of the CIA in 2017. When when Trump was inaugurated, Pompeo was the director of the CIA. And that's whenever Donald Trump learned what the deep state was and went on went ju and just shit on the deep state constantly and then all of a sudden the former director of the, the CIA is the secretary of state. That that's a little fishy to me. Right? Uh and again this is like this is exposed. That's why they, that's why a lot of people in the donor class don't like Trump is because he's sort of exposing all of their cracks. None of this stuff is done behind closed doors in a smoke-filled room. It's it's now still in a smoke-filled room, but the windows are open, and there's a couple people, and, and the door's unlocked, so we can kind of peek in to see what the fuck is going on. Um, you know, so uh, the intelligence community is not... I, 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 I don't know. Uh, I got to disagree with you that, that they get harassed by... Uh, a lot of presidents. Reagan was in, working in tandem with the intelligence. Nixon was 100% working in tandem with the intelligence community. Look at what happened to um, the, the the Vietnam whistleblower, uh, Daniel. Uh, oh shoot! If somebody remembers the the Vietnam whistleblower's name, the name is escaping me right now. Uh, please leave it in the uh, in in the in the comment section there. Uh, because the the name is escaping me for some reason, but I I, I will have to disagree to say that they get harassed on a lot. Uh, Jay Jackson, very funny comedian. Please, people should be following Jay. People should be, this. He is a man of several talents: uh, musician, comedian, actor, uh, developing a, a, a video game. Uh, full endorsement for Jay Jackson right here. <laughs> um, it also strikes me. Uh, that Joe's manner in this video is different and more, I'll say, less professional than what I would expect from a national candidate. Maybe it's just me, but it feels like he's trying too hard to relate to Charlemagne and his black audience. It's inauthentic. I agree. Uh, I think I think you 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 pretty much nailed exactly what I feel like um, is the issue with this video and the way that it, his demeanor is present is he is trying to relate. I, or I, I think he's trying to attempt to relate to the black community and he's not doing a great job. Um, it, it just kind of looks, it, to me, it's just, I'm just like, why are you yelling at Charlemagne? <laughs> as, uh, as someone who's prone to tangential thought while speaking extemporaneously, I get off topic, but this is something entirely else. Biden is uh, always been gaff prone, but now there's an added factor. He's clearly sunsetting and has been for a while. What floors me is the insistence from the Democratic faithful that everything is fine when it's so blatantly and obviously not. Yeah, I, you know, they started doing this a while back, I remember, where CNN and MSNBC refused to cover anything um, about um, Jay, uh, um, about Joe Biden's fucking like mental fortitude. Like they just stopped bringing it up. Um, and anytime they brought it up, anytime anybody brought it up, they would just fucking take them off the air. So, you know, I'm, I, it, they, they are trying to kind of um, close the door on it, which I think is why Charlemagne might have started the interview the way he did. Again, he's kind of getting them comfortable so that he would just talk about it a little bit more. Pittsburgh does sound like uh, something they serve at a 24-hour <laughs> dive bar served by a crusty waitress named Diane with a lit cigarette in her mouth. That's like my favorite dive bar you just described. <laughs> <laughs> Biden 2020, same shit, different day. Yeah, I feel like that that covers it. That covers it. 
Uh, William, thank you for watching, William. Uh, Biden's past can destroy him. Bernie's past is better. That's why I voted by mail and voted for Bernie Sanders. I would vote. Uh, I would vote for Biden if I have to, just to beat Trump. Uh, I hear this a lot. I hear this a lot, uh, and uh, I, I'm I'm not one to vote or shame anybody. Um, I just can't do it. I just can't. I just can't vote for the dude. His record's just too bad. And um, I saw a tweet today by uh, Jenk Uger from the uh, Young Turks, um, and I think he's running for Congress still. Where he said he would work to push Biden to the left, and um, I don't think the dude's going to move. I don't think he has any interest in moving. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, Jay Jackson, <laughs> oh, he could fuck all the way off mentioning South Carolina and, and Virginia. Like that's the only place black people live. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's classic Biden. <laughs> Daniel Ellsberg. Thank you, Jay and Dolores Pentagon papers. Daniel Ellsberg is the, uh, the whistleblower, uh, almost, almost got, um, like uh, over a hundred years in prison for for what he revealed so um thank you i i appreciate it the hive mind comes together again <laughs> all right let's uh let's dive back into into this interview this is where i come from i got involved i came home from college and i had a job with a really fancy law firm out of law school and my city is the only city in america occupied by the national guard the military for 10 months when Dr. King was shot. And I had this fancy job, a kid coming from a, from a lower middle income household. I quit and became a public defender. And I stayed in that community. I was the only guy when I was in high school, I had a job, a country club kind of job with a, at a swimming pool. I was the only white employee in the East side because I wanted to work in the projects because I wanted to understand. That's how I got involved in politics. That's what this is all about for me. It's about equality. It's about dignity. It's about treating people with respect. Why does he have to yell all of this at Charlemagne? Like that's the, this whole interview is every time Charlemagne asks a question, instead of just saying, "Hey, you know, um, my my background is uh, coming from a district that." has a, a large percentage of black people. And, uh, you know, I, I volunteered to go work in a black community. You could just say that and say, he's like, look at this shit. Look at this shit that I, how dare you? How dare you? Like, it's, it's so wild to me. And I got to give Charlemagne a lot of credit because he is just like super fucking poised. And he's just like, yeah, I hear, I, I hear you. I hear you old white man. <laughs> Look, everything that he's talking about is they're all very nice things that he did. But basically what, what it sounds like here um, by by him. Oh, I wanted to go to the to the to the black community. And I and I was a, an employee, uh, the only white employee in a in a in a black swimming pool in a black community or whatever. Um, and, you know, and that's how I started my political career. It kind of sounds like. Um, you know, in high school, when you have to do community service, like they, we had to do community service in, in my high school and you kind of do the 30 hours community service just to get the credits so you can graduate, right? Like that's kind of what this sounds like to me. He's like, I went into the black communities because I knew that I would need the black vote. So, you know, there it is. Boom, bing, bang, biggity, boom, went there. We got the swimming pool. They looked at the hair thing. They said the corn pops and the record players and bam, black votes, baby, black votes. <laughs> like that's, that's kind of what this sounds like, right? Again, as Jay pointed out, it's disingenuous. It just doesn't come off as like an authentic experience to me. It comes off as like, hey, I went to black communities to build my resume. I didn't go to the black communities because I care about what's happening in black America. I care about what's happening in this uh, in these unseen communities, in these communities that are often looked over and often uh, criminally brutalized, I went there because I knew that I would be able to get votes and start my career in politics that way. It's very, very disingenuous. Uh, you know, it's just him trying to get reelected over and over again and continue his tenure in politics. That's what this sounds like to me. You know, that's that's my that's my view on this. And so. You know, and you take a look at my record. People talk about the crime bill. 
crime bill didn't increase mass incarceration. Other things increased mass incarceration. And the reason why, if you go back and look, and I know you talk about it, you go back and take a look. That's why you had the vast majority of the black caucus at the time supporting the crime bill. Almost every major city black mayor supported the crime bill because blacks were getting killed overwhelmingly as well. And what happened when that crime bill? It had four or five really important things. It had the Violence Against Women Act. It said drug court, don't send anybody who has a drug problem to jail, send them to rehabilitation, to a drug court. It had in it that had the, uh, the assault weapons ban, getting rid of assault weapons, getting rid of the round, the number of rounds you could have in a gun. It also had in it a whole range of other things, but that things I didn't like. Clinton wanted to put in a deal where, in fact, three strikes and you're out. I opposed that three strikes and you're out bill. I oppose the position taking that, saying that you're going to have any mandatory sentences. But on balance, the whole bill, what happened was it did, in fact, bring down violent crime in black communities as well. And guess what? The fact is prison population didn't increase. 94% of every prisoner in jail is in a state prison, not a federal prison, no federal law. And here's the deal. The one thing I opposed in that bill was people wanting to give money to state prisons to build more prisons. I opposed it. But the point was, on balance, everything from the assault women's ban to the violence against women ban to the drug courts, they were important. And now, look what we can do. Look, I've been pushing along with my colleagues in a black caucus in the United States Congress. We should change the entire, and I've been doing this for a while, change the entire prison system from one that is punishment to rehabilitation. There's only a couple things everybody has in common in jail. One is they were <clears throat> the victims of abuse of their kids were, or, their, or, their, or, their, or their mother was. Number two, can't read. Number three, they don't have any job skills. They were in a position where they didn't get a chance. Why does it make sense? Why did I come along and write the first act that said, when you get out of prison, you don't just get a notion where you get 25 bucks and a bus ticket. You end up under the bridge. You end up under the bridge and just do the same place. So every single solitary person being released from prison should have access to every single government program. Why does it not make sense to have African-Americans who are getting out of prison who <coughs> serve their time, everybody for that matter, be able to have public housing? Why does it make sense that they can have Pell Grants to go to school? Why does it make sense they can have access to health care? What are we, nuts? Okay, again, I, I want to point out that the words he is saying are not false. <laughs> like, we do need to change the prison system. I've talked about, you know, the... Uh, various ways that we could change the prison system. I've done tons of videos about it. I've talked about it in my stand-up. Um, and and uh, not to pit myself, but it's just I don't want to keep going over the same points over and over again uh, and and make this video super long. But here's the thing. The, the problem with what he just said is uh, he overgeneralized like everybody in prisons. Like they come from a world of abuse. They're illiterate. They're unskilled workers who can't get a job once they get out. Like that's such a fucking crazy thing to say, right? Right now in prisons, we have former Black Panthers who are still in prison serving out like 100-year sentences for being a part of the Black Panthers. Not not for being, you know, not for being part of the, the, the violent end of the Black Panthers, community organizers, right? COINTELPRO happened. Um, COINTELPRO ramped up, by the way, only because community initiatives were, were spreading around the country and uh, people were starting to realize that the federal government is not providing them with any help, but rather these community initiatives are going to be helpful uh, and and save and save communities, essentially. Anyway, that's a little aside. But, but these Black Panthers right now that are in prisons are fucking scholars. They're geniuses. Like, 
So they're 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 geniuses in in law. They're geniuses in organization. They're geniuses in economic theory, and they are currently in prison. So what Joe Biden is saying, where he's generalizing what prisoners are by saying that they're unskilled, they're illiterate, and they all come from a background of abuse, is total fucking bullshit. I'm not saying that there aren't people in prison who might be illiterate, who might have come from a background of abuse, who might not be able to do you know, um, basic jobs and things of that sort, there is probably a percentage of the prison population in that, in that category, but that's not everybody. Like that's, it's such a, a wildly inaccurate thing to say. So, uh, he talks about mass incarceration. This has been a, uh, a thorn in Joe Biden's side since he decided to run for president. Since I, I, I would say that it was probably a thorn in Joe Biden's side when he was uh, Obama's VP. Uh, is the is the issue of mass incarceration and the 1994 crime bill, which he brought up in this situation as well. So there's a bunch of different articles. The the main one that I uh, found uh, rather informative is from Mother Jones. Uh, which again is 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 a publication that I uh, wax and wane on. Some things I really like that they cover. Other things are very very uh, weirdly biased. Uh, they you know so um, this one I felt like they did a pretty good job and it kind of you know looking at different sources they were hitting on some uh, on some good points. Actually, um, Jay Jay Jackson posted a, an a, an excellent article uh, that kind of breaks down a lot. Uh, of of Biden's policies and how they've how it's affected the black community from the Guardian. It's an excellently written article. Um, so one of the things to uh, to to point out here is uh, mass incarceration in America has been increasing pretty damn steadily since the '70s, uh, and the 1994 crime bill didn't did not stop that. It didn't decrease it in any way. Um, it might have decreased the rate at which mass incarceration was happening, but it did not actually stop mass incarceration. It did not do a significant decrease in it. Um, you know, and I think you could see that just in the last 10 years with, I mean, fuck, how many, how many videos do we see of innocent black people getting harassed and killed by the police? How many videos do we see of indigenous people getting killed and harassed by the police, right? It's just like this, this shit is not slowing down. The 1994 crime bill did not slow any of that stuff down. So the other thing that he talked about is a bunch of states that, uh, were on board. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, $12.5 billion were given to state prisons as long as they kept prisoners serving 85% of their sentences. 85% of the sentences. That's not rehabilitation, folks. Let's say somebody is in prison for 100 years. That means in order for that prison to keep getting money, they have to at least serve out 85 years of that, right? But let's say within 10 years, that prisoner has... Um, become become a, a model prisoner you know there there have been no um, no uh, you know bad behavior no fights they've kind of kept to their duty they f and and it feels like they've learned they will still get denied parole because the states want to get that money these state prisons want to get that money so they get denied parole this is not about rehabilitation that's not rehabilitation that is fucking profit that's in the crime bill in 1994 that increases mass incarceration that pushes people to create more laws that push more people into prison when you incentivize this sort of shit uh, the guy that was uh, in charge of the civil rights Div division under president obama uh said that uh that that this 12.5 billion dollar provision to to state prisons built up the prison population because it's the incentive. So what I just said, it's been corroborated by somebody as part of the Obama administration that worked with Biden for uh, eight years. Now he did call the three strike, what he, what he said about the three strike rule was true. He did oppose the three strike rule. Uh, he went publicly and said it was wacko. 
Uh, that's a quote, and it, I, it's very believable that Joe Biden would use the word wacko, uh, even in 1994, right? Uh, the, the dude in <laughs> the dude's tour bus was all about malarkey. Like, that's <laughs> like, this is very, 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 very clear that he probably said this, right? Um, what he did say was he wanted to get violent offenders in prison and get them off the street, which again is incongruent to him talking about rehabilitation. Uh, a video I did maybe about a year and a half ago talked about Brazil has a uh, has a prison system, or I, I rather had. Uh, Jair Bolsonaro is kind of an authoritarian dictator. I don't think this prison system is surviving, but it became this big thing um, for a while. And uh, it was a prison with no guards. The prisoners kept themselves in prison. Uh, they felt like they needed to serve their time and uh, reflect and better themselves to re-enter society and become functioning members. What did that mean? Um, that meant um, that they took tasks on, jobs, things of that sort, helped out the community, but would return back to prison walls. Uh, that's rehabilitation. And, uh, you know, they all kind of monitored each other. And the, and the harshest of them, these violent offenders that Joe Biden's talking about in Brazil, uh, would do more indoor tasks at first. And then once they kind of felt more comfortable, would would interact with uh, doing more publicly related tasks. That's rehabilitation. I mean, that's a very, very progressive notion of rehabilitation, where you are really a, looking into the psychology of what caused somebody to get that violent. Uh, saying you want them off the streets and to be put into a prison for profit system well, you know, we're, we're not getting rid of the violence in our society. Uh, putting putting laws that, that take, you know, small drug offenders and put them in the same prison cell as a violent offenders, uh, it makes it very difficult to say that it's about rehabilitation. So, you know, I, there's some incongruity with, within what, what he's saying here. The, the problem with the prison system that, that I see is that it is profit driven. It is a profit driven system that is marketed as a vindictive, vengeful way to incur God's wrath on a mortal plane. That's kind of what this prison system is, right? You will incur God's wrath on a mortal plane. And, and the 1994 crime bill that Joe Biden helped pass is basically helped that happen, help push that happen. Uh, all right, we're gonna do one more clip and then I'm going to look at some comments and then we'll, we'll get to the end of this video. And the, here we go. I, I, As we keep doing. Yeah, so I, sorry. That's uh that's. Oh shit. That's our time oh, there. No, no, I, I, I'm sorry. I know Jill has to use this, but I, I want, I've talked too much. I apologize. No, let me, I, I gotta, I gotta ask you though. <laughs> I like how they were just like, okay, Joe, uh, Joe Biden just said something against Queen Hillary and you can't, uh, you, you can't do that, right? Like black media just touched a nerve about Joe Biden's record and they were just like, we got to cut cut the interview. You can't say anything about Queen Hillary or bring up the fact that uh, Joe Biden actually did a lot of bad things to black people uh, with his crime bill that he's very proud of. Okay, every, just can we just uh, shut it down? <laughs> I don't know who that guy is, but uh, that was uh, very entertaining. Um, I'm, I'm gonna look at some comments before. Uh, here we go. Uh, I was gonna. I thought. I honestly did th think that he was gonna tell the corn pop story, Jay. I did too. I, I really did. <laughs> uh, for the oh, thank you for posting the article. The, Jay posted the article. Uh, also, thank you for the shout outs. Appreciate you. Keep up the good fight. Hell yeah. I'm. I'm. I'm glad you watch these videos, man. It makes it more fun when you're, when you're in here. Uh, what a train wreck, indeed. And it's. It, it only gets worse. Uh, if you look at his voting record, um, Biden is way right. He is. Uh, he he has a lot of far right ideologies, and I mean, that's that's sort of what neoliberalism is. Um, to to some degree, neoliberalism, uh, and this is not the abject definition of neoliberalism. This is an aspect of neoliberalism. Is essentially to present these d sort of. It's basically to present conservative ideas. Uh, using very nice words uh, and speaking compassionately while you're taking rights away from people and while you're trying to monetize on people's identities. They, that's sort of what neoliberalism does. Uh, 
Um, and Joe Biden is is an excellent example of that. He is a Democrat that preaches himself to be on the side of the working class. He preaches himself to be a man of the people. And then he essentially puts legislation in place to ensure that that these people will end up in prison. Uh, and then they'll stay in prison because the prisons get to make money. And because he supported these for-profit prisons, he gets to make money as well. Um, so, you know, I, I think he's sort of the... Um, the de the definition of that and his voting record does line up more with uh with republicanism oh i maybe it lines up a little bit more with um uh republicanism in in like the 60s and 70s than it does now because i think the republican party has moved way way further to the right and and we do have to give uh bill clinton some credit for moving the democratic party away from center left into into full right um so yeah i think i think you're 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 correct there danny thank you for thank you for the comment i appreciate it all right now uh let us continue forward with this video we're gonna we're gonna uh get all the way to the end because the end that's when the good stuff comes in you guys <laughs> you know why so much resistance on admitting the crime bill in, in other legislation you are a part of was damaging to the black community. Because we had Hillary on a few years ago, uh, and Ms. Ms. Clinton said that the crime bill, made, we made a lot of mistakes with that, and she wanted to atone for that by becoming the next president. Like She was wrong. What happened was, it wasn't the crime bill. It was the drug legislation. It was the, in the institution of mandatory minimums, which I oppose. Mandatory, I man. I thought, the you, I thought you. I thought you create. I thought you uh, was a part of that in '84 as well. The Comprehensive Crime Control Act that established mandatory minimum sentences for drug offenses. No, no. What happened was, you're, what you're confusing is what. What happened was, the Black Caucus came to me and said, "Look, one of that. Well, I did this study when I was chairman of the Judiciary Committee. We looked at every district of the <laughs> of, the, of the ten court districts in America, federal court districts, and we found out that." If you got arrested for robbery and convicted, and I got arrested for robbery and convicted, it was the first time, you went to jail an average of 13 years. I went to jail an average of three years. So there was this whole move, same time for the same crime. So no one based on their color could go to jail longer than anybody else for the same crime. So what happened was there was a judicial selection committee setting up that how you deal with making sure that the sentencing process is taken out of the hands of a uh, prosecutor saying, I'm going to want 12 years, 13 years for you, and three years for me. The end result of that was the unintended consequence, which we changed, Barack and I did, was the fact that you, in fact, all of a sudden, you could not lower my sentence or your sentence be uh, lower than what was the average sentence for everybody else going to jail in the districts. That's how that came about. It didn't say mandatory. We said to the judges, you can't send people to jail for the same crime different times. They have to be within a, 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 a framework. That's why that has been changed. And while I was vice president, I helped Barack, we reduced the prison population by 38,000 people. 38,000 people. And the only, the only mandatory was in there was carjacking, which I opposed, and three strikes and you're out, which is ridiculous. It only was imposed three times. But still, even once makes no sense. The idea of three ties, three strikes and you're out. Give me a break. And the other thing we have to do, one of the things that, you know, I was a public defender. I'm going to insist when I'm president that a public defender gets, a federal public defender gets paid the same amount of money as a federal prosecutor gets paid. So you have representation. People have representation. Uh, yeah, that's great. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I sure do hope that public defenders get paid better. Um, here's the biggest thing is he's going, I mean, he's really going after Queen Hillary here. Like, like the DNC is probably fucking pissed. Uh, so let's look at some of the things that, that he brought up, right? 1984, Charlemagne talked about the 1984 Comprehensive Crime Control Act. He, he, it added, it definitely added mandatory minimums and it abolished federal parole. That was the 1984 Crime Control, um, Crime Control Act that Joe Biden was a part of. 
uh, kept people in prison longer, and there was no, there was no, no fucking incentive to rehabilitate, right? Then we go forward, 1986, there were harsher sentences uh, for crack cocaine than cocaine, which meant that they were targeting black Americans. Uh, cr crack cocaine was a drug that was prevalent within the black communities. Uh, cocaine was primarily a white drug in the 80s, and people got harsher sentences for crack cocaine, despite the fact that crack cocaine and cocaine, virtually the same thing. Um, I'm not an expert on doing these drugs, but from what I've read about them, not a lot of fucking difference. But there you go, right? W where was where was the thing? It's called crack cocaine. Oh, it's got so we got to make it harsher because that's in the black community and the regular cocaine. We can well, we can give these guys two to three years. You know, give 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 the crack cocaine people fifteen to twenty years. So there you go. There there's another incongruity for you. In 1986, he pushed for harder sentences um, de depending on the color of your skin and the drug of your choice. Uh, 1993, he started changing his tune, but then the 1994 crime bill had a bunch more mandatory sentences uh, written in there. <laughs> he wrote more more legislation for mandatory sentences. So he's against mandatory sentences, but his flagship bill that he is so fucking proud of in 1994 that he that he basically represents himself by has the thing that he says he's against. Finally, in 2010, he reduced sentencing for uh, crack cocaine offenses. Great. So, I mean, only about 30 years too late, right? After the damage was done to, to the black community at that point, you know, so... I mean, to the people that are thinking that you can push Biden over to the left, you you probably can in, in, in about 30 years if he gets to be about 30. He's 77, so by the time he's 107, he'll be a little bit over to the left. <clears throat> Excuse me. After millions and millions of people have gone to prison and have possibly died there. This dude's not moving anywhere to the left. <clears throat> All right, let us let us continue. But the bottom line is the other piece is I'm going to try to change, and I've laid it out. I'll send you a copy of my plan, so you have it to deliver see. Every it. Voice, pardon me. What deliver every voice or what? No, the one that I the plan I have is my manifesto for Black America. Ooh, oh God! Uh, as a as an older white dude, you shouldn't say that you have a manifesto for black America. Oh my God, that's not good. Oh, that, oh, you should, you should very much rethink that, that phrase. You have a man, nobody that's ever written a manifesto for black America has ever been like, here's my manifesto to help black America as an old white dude. It's always just like, here's my manifesto for why black America needs to go down. Like that's always, this, that's a bad, whoo. Not not a good look. Not a good look, Joey B. <laughs> not a good look. Oh man! All right, but this is this is going to be a little bit uh, one of the longer ones too. And a span, particularly the portion of it that relates to how, in fact, we're going to deal with the prison system. If you are in prison, if you are convicted of a crime, no one should be going to jail for drug crime. Period. Nobody. Nobody. So, no so matter what the crime, particularly marijuana, which makes no sense for people to go to jail. They should be just wiped out completely. And I, the reason I, is that, what, if anything, for those crimes that are actually continue to be crimes, scheduled crimes, as marijuana shouldn't be anymore, what is happening is you shouldn't go to prison. You should go to a, a mandatory rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. It costs less to put people in a drug rehabilitation program than it does in jail. And you have a chance. We got to give people a chance. Well, you know, Vice President Biden, I've read some of your black agenda, and you say that you would decriminalize marijuana. What's the difference between legalizing it and decriminalizing it? Because they're trying to find out whether or not there is any impact on the use of marijuana, not in leading you to other drugs, but what it affects, does it affect long term development of the brain? And we should wait till the studies are done. Uh, 
Well, that's a fucking horseshit argument because there's been studies that have been done about that forever. We have CBD, THC, and other cannabinoid receptors in our brains, and we have seen a lot more positive effects of, um, of marijuana and hemp in medical use than negative ones. Uh, I did an interview. I'm friends with uh, Patrick and Teresa Nightingale of the Pittsburgh Normal, N-O-R-M-L, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. And they talk about this exact thing that I just brought up. That's that's actually where I learned a lot of the information. It's a fantastic podcast. Uh, I, I recommend uh, you guys go check it out if you have the time. Uh, Taboo Table Talk, uh, I, it probably came out about a month or two ago uh, is when I released the episode. But it is a fantastic conversation where they basically debunk this bullshit argument that's being presented here, right? Oh, we should decriminalize it, which just basically means if you get caught with marijuana, you do the same thing you get to go you you get to go to rehab you have to go to rehab for a plant could you there's no fucking plant that you need to go to a rehab for could you imagine if 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 that went through and they went to a community garden and looked at somebody that was planting some fucking rutabagas and was just like hey look it looks like you got a problem there's a bunch of these rutabagas all over all, uh, all over this garden over here and we got to send you to rehab for putting this plant in the ground Seems like you have a problem. Seems like you have a real big rutabaga problem over here. It's it's such an outrageous fucking thought process. We've had research done from the scientific community about this exact thing that he's talking about. He just doesn't want to legalize it uh, federally because that means that he would lose money from the pharmaceutical industry and the health insurance industry. What she doesn't want to do. Here's the thing. I think if you've never smoked weed or taken edibles, which I, I don't know if Joe Biden ever has smoked weed or taken edibles, uh, there's a chance. I'm. Uh, we got to do the studies to figure this out. Is If you have never smoked weed, there's a chance uh, that millions and millions of people will watch your brain fall out of your head on national television uh, all the time. We got to do the study. Science, as Joe Biden is about to say. I think science matters. I think we got decades. I think we got decades and decades of studies from actual weed smokers, though. Yeah, I do. I know a lot of weed smokers. <laughs> dude, I do, <laughs> I do not think Joe Biden understood what Charlemagne <laughs> just fucking said there. I don't think he understood the joke that Charlemagne was making. Uh, right, which is again, also, I know a lot of very intelligent weed smokers, I know a lot of productive weed smokers. Um, uh, it's great. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm endorsing, uh, I don't know, it's your choice, you do what you want with it. Uh, but I, you know, I, I think it's fine. Uh, <laughs> but I totally don't fucking think he understood that joke. I, I love that face again, not to brag, but that's a fucking great still. Isn't it? Soak that one in, baby. Soak that one in. All right, let's keep going. I want to ask you about your your, your running mate. Um, I don't know if you saw. Well, I saw the day that a news report broke that uh, Amy Klobuchar was being vetted, and a lot of people on social media they're not too happy about that. And um, it's because they want your running mate to be a black woman. I don't know if you saw the op-ed in the Washington Post by some of the leading black women voices in this country. And they feel since black women are such a loyal voting block and black people saved your political life in the primaries this year, they have things they want from you. And one of them is a black woman running mate. What, what do you say to them? What I say to them is that I'm not acknowledging anybody who is being considered, but I guarantee you there are multiple black women being considered. Uh, okay. <laughs> That kind of just that kind of just was like, hey, uh, I'm just gonna ignore all the women that are being considered. I'm not acknowledging anybody that's being considered. I understand what he was trying to say, but that phrasing was just so bad. <laughs> like it's like it really just sounds like he's just like, I'm ignoring women. <laughs> Dude, just say I haven't made a decision on who my vice presidential candidate is gonna be. Uh, I'm, we're, we're, we're looking at, at them, uh, and we do have several black women that are, are in consideration. And once I have looked through all of the, uh, all of, all of the choices, I will make a decision based on skill, 
based on who I think would, uh, would, would represent the administration the best instead of I'm not considering any of these women's voices because there's a lot of women's voices. <laughs> what the fuck? Oh my God. Uh, Amy Klobuchar, by the way, if he chooses Amy Klobuchar, would 100% prove that Joe Biden does not give a shit about black America because uh, Amy Klobuchar put an innocent black kid in prison. I did a video uh, about this. Um, I don't know, maybe back in February or something, maybe earlier than that. Uh, I'm not exactly sure, but I have my notes from that here. It, his name was uh, uh, Mayan Burrell. He got a life sentence, uh, and there was a lot of shit that went wrong with the case. First and foremost, he was interrogated for eight hours without a per his mother. He maintained his innocent um, innocence, and then detectives were offering $500. Uh, oh, uh, it, it was in regards to a, a murder of a, a, a child, a murder of another child, right? And Myron Burrell is a, is a minor. That, and he got a life sentence in prison. Um, and uh, detectives were offering like $500 and they weren't corroborating the information that they were getting. Um, she exploited this case. Uh, the Racial Justice Center in, uh, I believe, Minneapolis basically said that, uh, you know, she, her tough on crime bill is putting people in prison without any evidence. Um, my my and Burrell's mom passed away, and he was not allowed to attend her funeral. They they make these special provisions, special cases where you can attend certain things like funerals or birthdays, and and you know there'll be like a guard there or whatever. wasn't allowed to do it. Public safety, he's too dangerous. Uh, maintained his innocence the whole time. He was forced into signing a, a guilty plea deal uh, for a crime he didn't commit. Somebody actually came out and confessed to the crime. And uh, Amy Klobuchar, as the DA, uh, ignored it, said it was nothing, forced him to sign this plea deal, and basically fucking ruined this kid's life uh, to show that she was tough on crime. Uh, that's who Amy Klobuchar is. She's asked about this uh, uh, a bunch of times. Uh, the black community has called her out for absolutely no accountability. Um, she has backed up police officers that were accountable for killing innocent black kids, uh, innocent black people. Um, her staff also had the highest turnover rate because they couldn't deal with Amy Klobuchar's outbursts. Uh, so, yeah. If you, if you want to 100% say that you don't care about the black community, go ahead and pick Amy Klobuchar, who put an innocent black kid, mine Burrell, in prison for life when there was all of the evidence saying that he was guilt innocent. Let's continue. Multiple. Well, you know, Thanks so much. That's really our time. I apologize. You can't do that to black media. You I can't do that to white media and black media because my wife has to go on at six o'clock. Okay. Oh, uh oh, I'm in trouble. Listen, you got to come see us when you come to New York, VP Biden. Cause it's I a, will. It's a long way until November. We got more questions. You got more okay. questions. But I tell you, if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, and you ain't black. They don't have and there it is, folks. That's the moment. And by the way, he is super fucking proud of that joke. He is super incredibly proud of that statement, too. He basically went on uh on the breakfast club this has uh, almost a million views right now um and he basically said uh black republicans are not black he questioned black republicans blackness uh and then in his head biden's like nailed it fucking joey b you did it buddy you did it you corn popped that joke you nailed it buddy you nailed it baby boy like he, he is like, I watch his face, watch his face in the next couple of seconds uh, while you pay attention to what Charlemagne is saying, because that that's also, that's also very important to, to, as to what you get it. Sorry. I'm, 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 I'm Joe Biden stumbling, uh, <laughs> but let's, let's keep going. I have nothing to do with Trump. It has to do with the fact I want something for my community. I would love to see. Take a look at my record, man. I extended the voting racks 25 years. I have a record that is second to none. The NAACP has endorsed me every time I've run. 
the world, I mean, come on. The NAACP does not endorse candidates, you guys. That's a huge lie that he just spewed out right there. Huge fucking lie. The NAACP, have, they, first of all, they've never endorsed Biden. Um, they don't endorse political candidates. They're a 5013C nonprofit uh, whose primary mission is the advancement of black communities across America. They don't endorse president. Like they, There have been multiple tweets and there have been multiple official statements put out by uh, various local chapter presidents that say this. That they don't endorse presidential candidates. Over a million people have now viewed Joe Biden in another fucking lie about how much the black community loves him. He said that he, he was imprisoned with, with Nelson Mandela. What? This dude, I don't know if he's doing it on purpose or not, but it's, it's a huge fucking problem. Huge fucking problem. Derek Johnson, uh, who's the president of the N NAACP, uh, basically said he encourages Joe Biden to look into the struggles of black America and that they look forward to work with him if and when he becomes president, that they, they look forward to seeing his leadership and his plans and helping him execute his vision uh, to move black Americans forward. That's not an endorsement. That's that's just saying, hey, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing whether you can get this shit done. And, you know, like if you need help, you know, we'll, we'll do our part. That's not saying we endorse you for president. And he basically not just that, that and that was just for 2020. He's saying that in his 36 year tenure that and the NAACP has endorsed him every single time when they don't endorse political candidates at all. He just made this shit up, man. He just made this shit up, right? He made this shit up about, about the Nelson Mandela thing uh, and being super endorsed by the Dublin's and, uh, <laughs> NAACP. And while we're at it, you know, uh, while we're just making a bunch of shit up, I don't know if you guys know this or not. I don't know if you heard this or not, but I, 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 just, I just found this out doing my research is Joe Biden actually saved Lieutenant Dan in Vietnam. I don't know if you guys know that or not. Save Lieutenant Dan. The man could have lost his life. He just lost his legs. Uh, you know, that was because of Joey B. Joey B is right there. Okay. He also saved the galaxy uh, from a race of uh, superbugs. He did that. I if you, if you didn't get that reference, it's Starship Troopers. Uh, <laughs> it's a very deep cut reference, I understand. But uh, yeah. And this is the guy that's that's supposed to be more mentally fit than Donald Trump to be in office who just spent 18 minutes yelling at a black man about his record that, that a very calm, intelligent and stoic black entrepreneur pushed back on. And all Joe Biden could do for 18 minutes was yell at this man. Right. Take a look at this, the record. All right. Thank you so much. I really, yeah. anyway, thanks. I will come back. All right. I look Please. forward to seeing you. He's so excited. Okay. Absolutely. I don't think Charlemagne's very excited about seeing him in person. I don't think Charlemagne's very excited about seeing seeing him in person. Um, before I, I want to look at your comments, uh, and I have uh, two more parts to cover before we wrap up today. Uh, but uh, he apologized the same way that Joe Biden apologizes by not saying "I'm sorry" and "I learned a lesson." Uh, he basically said, I should have, I shouldn't have been, uh, as cavalier as I was something to the effect of that. I, or I'm, I shouldn't have been so cavalier, right? I was a little bit too loose with my words. That's what Joe Biden said, uh, which, which translation means, uh, I should be more careful about when I'm going to be racist. I shouldn't be so overtly and publicly racist. You know, racism is really, uh, for you and that special loved one in a closed door, uh, and money is being moved around between you and your donor class. That's where racism belongs, guys. Okay? In a very private, intimate setting. His apology basically is, I need to be more careful about where and when I'm going to be racist. Where I'm going to say uh, this weird shit. This is who he is. 
by the way, I think. Um, he is an angry man that can't be cha that that can't be challenged. That has a problem with being challenged. Kind of sounds like Trump. Whenever you challenge Trump, he does some weird childish thing, and then he goes into name calling. Joe Biden just adjusts. He just starts yelling at you and reciting, and then tells you you don't understand him. A few weeks ago, uh, a, a bunch of my kind of smushy liberal friends and and Democrats. I know I'm being mean. My, I, I you know, my the, the the liberal folks that I'm friends with, um, they kind of came at me because I posted a YouTube comment from a prior Joe Biden video, uh, a very racist YouTube comment from a prior Joe Biden video. And they just couldn't, they just couldn't understand. Oh, it's gotta be, this must be a Trump supporter. Oh, it can't be a liberal. Joe Biden just said, if you don't vote for Democrats, you're not black. And then basically his apology was like, I need to be quieter about my racism. And you can't believe that there might be some Joe Biden fans that would tell a a brown comedian who does political commentary to go eat curry and not talk about politics because that's what that comment said. And they just couldn't believe it. I travel all across the country and the last five years, uh, minimum the last five years I've had. I, and I know I say this quite often, but I really want to reiterate this point. I've had more conservatives come to my show and tell me huh, I never thought about it that way. Explain to me their viewpoints and beliefs, and we might have our disagreements, but we can still be respectable about it. And I've had more liberals, more of these smushy liberals, more of these good boy Democrats that are going to vote blue no matter who, that will angrily leave a show or desperately try to convince me that I need to vote for a party that has no interest in helping me out, no interest in looking at what I'm going through and legislating on the behalf of the people. And then if I don't, I'm a fascist. I'm I'm overprivileged. That's what they say. That's what they tell to me. I'm I have too much white privilege. That's why I can't vote any blue, no matter who. Guys, I grew up in this country under the Bush era and the Obama era. I grew up under the largest deportations when a Democrat was president. I grew up under the Patriot Act. I grew up under NSA surveillance. We all did. It don't matter who's in that office. If it's a corporate candidate, yeah, they're going to fuck you over. I'm going to read an MLK quote that I've read before because it's important. It's a Martin Luther King Jr. quote uh, about, about white moderates, about the moderate liberal. Uh, and warning, there is a, a word that some people might consider uncouth, but again, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was in the 60s where this world kind of has a, has a different context. So I'm just kind of getting that out there. Uh, but this is an MLK quote. Uh, and it says, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's greatest stumbling block in his stride towards freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers negative peace, which is the absence of tension to positive peace, which is the presence of justice. This is, uh, this is, Joe Biden is who MLK is talking about. He is the white moderate the white liberal that is trying to uh, get rid of the tension. You know, hey, just do what, I, do what I'm saying. I'm a liberal. I'm a good guy. Just do what I'm saying. Trust me, it's going to be good. And when you push back against them, they get pissed. Same thing with, with the people that support him. Um, not all people. There, a percentage of Joe Biden's supporters will come out and they will make these, you know, these, these uh, over-the-top comments. And they're choosing complacency rather than real progress. And that's a damn shame, in my opinion. While we're on the topic of justice, while we're talking about the crime bill, in what portion of the crime bill, in what portion of anything that Joe Biden legislated for, uh, you know, to, to prevent more criminality in this country, where in, in, in any of these bills does it say what's going to happen to the bankers that caused the financial crash of 08? 
or the bankers that are causing the recession now? Is that in there? Or is it just continuing to put more poor and black people in prison? Uh, I want to look at the, uh, the comment section before we get to our, uh, our, our, our final uh, little segment of this, of this thing here. Uh, Danny, yes, please look at his <laughs> record of FFs. Yeah, uh, they're bad. Jay, the statement came out of nowhere. There was no context. It was apropos of literally nothing. Charlemagne was wrapping up the interview. He was off the hook. All he had to say was nothing, and we wouldn't be talking about this. He made this bet all by himself. He absolutely did. Um, and and all he all Charlemagne said is that he wants something positive for the black community, which challenged Joe Biden because what. What Charlemagne is saying is there are a lot of things in your record that showed the opposite. And Joe Biden has to prove unequivocally that he is excellent for the black community, regardless of the fact that his record shows quite the opposite. And he did make this bet. He could have just shut the fuck up, but he can't. He treats he treats oppositional journalism the same way that Trump treat, treats oppositional journalism. When you question Trump and push back against Trump, he does the same shit. He it's just there is more insults levied and more more I think uh, direct racist comments rather than these weird sort of like wait what the fuck was that kind of and and then it hits the internet right. Danny, Joe Biden can't comprehend the struggles. That's the problem. Yeah. And, you know, it's very strange because you would figure that somebody that has Joe Biden's background of growing up in a working class family where, you know, it, it, where he had to hit poverty a couple times when he was a kid. Apparently, that's the story that he would understand the struggles, that he would know what what poor people need. But he doesn't. You're right. He does not. Uh, we need to stop asking old cis white male politicians to look out for the best interests of black, brown, LGBTQ, and women constituents, Democrat or no. They never have, they never will, and we have got to change this. I agree, absolutely. Uh, look at your local, look at your local uh, candidates. How many of them are from your communities? How many of them are from the working class world? We saw AOC. I'll, I'll give AOC that she, she matches the identities and she also, once again, speaks to a lot of the belief systems that I have, but she has bent the knee to Nancy Pelosi a few too many times. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little tired of it. I got to be honest. You know, it, it, it upsets me deeply to see that sort of stuff happen. Uh, but Jay's, Jay's right. They're not going to bend. They're not going to change. They are going to look for muddied interests. There, there needs to be a new breed of politician that is not looking for muddied interests and does kind of show the diversity that's actually representative of this country. Uh, and, and it's up to us to, to, to push those candidates, right? To, and it's okay to challenge the people that we like, right? So if you are a Joe Biden supporter, you should look at this and be like, this is a bad look. And his apology is half-hearted at best. And, and this should question whether or not Joe Biden is the right guy for you or not. And that's okay. I questioned a bunch of shit that Bernie Sanders did. I questioned a bunch of shit that Tulsi Gabbard did. Um, you know, and, and that's okay. You're allowed to do that. You're allowed to do that. Bernie Sanders and Tulsi endorsed Joe Biden. And I was just like, what the fuck is this all about? Andrew Yang did the same thing, but, and that, but you should be able to challenge your leaders. That's our right as citizens. That's part of our rights as citizens. The final part of this I brought up earlier uh, about what's going on with this pandemic in, uh, in Black America, right? And Joe Biden talked about this at the very top of the show. And then kind of never they, they just never brought it up again and that's well you saw what happened they got cut off um as of may 20th this is a guardian reporting that i read as of may 20th twenty thousand black americans have been reported to have died because of covid19 the last number i heard was eighty thousand people total in america that have died uh that's 
that's a quarter of the population. Uh, that's a quarter of the death toll that's from black America, you guys. One quarter of the death toll. That's fucking crazy. And this is only what's reported, right? Uh, and there are some states that are not releasing racial information. So it could be higher. The percentage could be higher. We could be looking at 30, 35%. Because there's states like Nebraska and Montana that are not releasing the um, the racial breakdown. Not only that, but I think the number of overall deaths from this disease is probably a lot higher as well because not everybody can afford testing. It's It's just too expensive for some people. Not everybody can afford the treatment. Not everybody can afford paid time off. Because you got companies like Amazon that are that are cutting back paid time off, that are cutting up cutting back sick leave, that are taking away hazard pay to the essential workers. So I think these numbers are going to be much higher, right? And then on top of that, we have no idea what the numbers are going to be when we look at the economic factor involved. There are a lot of black people that are unfortunately in a very tight economic situation. There's a lot of brown people that are in a very tight economic situation. Women, members of the LGBTQ community. Class doesn't know colors and sexual identities and sexual orientation. Working class people are struggling in this country. And I think a lot more working class people, regardless of your gender, your race, your creed, your sexual orientation, or your identity, are going to face a lot of hardships because the donor class that Joe Biden belongs to, that community, which he bragged about earlier, isn't doing a goddamn thing to help the working class people. I think if you look at the number of people uh, that die because they don't have health care, that you know will break a leg or get a stomach problem or uh, early, early signs of cancer or something along those lines, you're going to see those numbers go up. You're going to see those numbers go up. There is a plan in place. You can use Medicare for all. You can use uh, this the the uh, war wartime defense act, I think, or something along those lines, or, or and a federal jobs guarantee idea. If healthcare is nationalized, uh, put more people to work. Uh, Sweden did this. I know there's some controversy over over what Sweden did, but Sweden did get a couple things right. First of all, they took a bunch of people from the airline industry and trained them to do administrative work in hospitals and, and sterilize hospital equipment. They also made hospital equipment. They also made PPEs to give to, to, to make sure that their healthcare system wasn't get over, gonna get overrun by this thing. So there you go. There's a way that you can use federal jobs guarantees and this defense act, defense manufacturing act. But, the, but we're not doing that. And everybody in the middle class is suffering because of it. A measure of a country should be determined by how well it takes care of its poorest and most vulnerable. And right now, Joe Biden is failing at that because he has no plans. He went into hiding in his fucking basement cave that he has to share, I guess, with his wife. Trump is failing because he refuses to look at anything except for how to make money off of this thing. The Democrats are failing because they literally refuse to put legislation in place and fight for that legislation to help middle class Americans. The Republicans are failing because they don't give a shit. They don't give and they're very forward about it. <laughs> the liberals are failing. The conservatives are failing. I'll tell you where we're not failing. What we're doing inside our own communities, we're not failing at that. I have seen more generosity. I've seen more acts of kindness. I've seen more people willing to take care of each other from a distance than I have in any other time in my life right now. Mutual aids are succeeding. Mutual aids. There's, I've talked about mutual aid revolutions all across this country all the time. A bunch of times I've brought this up in my videos. Mutual aids are succeeding. There's no quid pro quo. If you can, great. If you can give something in return, great. If you can financially contribute, great. That's awesome. But if you can't, that's okay because they're there to help. You're going through a rough time. Your community's got you. That's what mutual aid is. Eleanor Goldfield, who's uh, been on my podcast, she's a good friend of mine. I've, I've, I get a chance to uh, talk to her and work with her quite often. 
uh, is doing a lot of great mutual aid work in DC. And uh, my good friend Lee Camp and Eleanor do these live streams on Fridays and uh, or Thursdays, I think. Thursdays and at some point during the week. Uh, I think it's Thursdays. Sorry. Days of the week are starting to get blurred if I don't have a date associated with them. Um, but but they're but they're raising funds for mutual aid. And whatever little you can give is enough. It helps. So keep your eyes peeled for their live streams um, and, and donate to a mutual aid. Donate to a mutual aid in your community. See if there's anybody doing this mutual aid type of stuff. Um, you know, see who's hurting in your community. Is there somebody that needs your help? Boom, you helping them out. You going over there and saying, hey, here's a bag of groceries. Here's a giant fucking casserole. Mutual aid, there, there it is. Jay, I know Jay did some stuff where, where he um, had some pasta and he made some pasta and he gave it to some folks. That's fucking mutual aid. That's all it is. I've seen more of that happen now than ever. And you know where it's not coming from? From fucking Congress. None of it's coming from Congress. Worker strikes, those are going to succeed. That's going to push back. So they have to they have to do what we need. Those workers are, are going to show people exactly how essential workers are. You want your groceries? Well, what are you going to do when there ain't going to be when there's any nobody to fucking get the groceries into the store? What are you going to do when there's nobody there to check it out? What are you going to do when there's nobody there to deep clean Target? Because these people need to be treated properly, and they're not, and they're not in a safe working environment. Those are probably going to succeed. We're heading our way into a general strike, folks. There are hospital employees right now that are pretty goddamn sick of the way we're doing shit in this country, and they are starting to strike. That's fucking exciting to me. Our solidarity will succeed. Us helping each other out. We'll succeed in that. We will succeed in that. All right, that is uh, that is the 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 last little bit of uh, of what I have to say. I want to look at the last couple comments coming in here. Uh, healthcare system is less likely to test people of color. They slap a bandage on it and wash their hands. Yeah, um, that's kind of what they do. <laughs> they don't really go into the low income communities. Actually, there was a doctor. Uh, he was a black doctor that got profiled in uh, Florida. Um, and he was going and testing homeless people and making sure, you know, do they have uh, COVID? Uh, what are they doing to keep to do to, to socially distance? Do they have masks? Do they have gloves? How do we treat this thing? What do we do to take care of them? What do we do to make sure that the and he got in and he got racially profiled and almost arrested uh, because the cop couldn't believe that he was an, a, a, a doctor, right? Nobody's going into that. It's just individual doctors making the decision for themselves to go into these communities, go into poor people's communities and help them out, give them testing, give them treatment, get them masks, get them gloves. Yeah. You know? A general strike will be the final straw. It's the only thing that people have left. Yeah, that's usually what, what happens with strikes. Uh, we've talked a bunch about strikes um, uh, on these videos, and that's usually what happens. You know, you try to negotiate, uh, but with the with the state of unions in this country, there's really no not a lot of collective bargaining happening. There's not a lot of collective bargaining happening at McDonald's or Amazon. Uh, or a bunch of these giant corporations that are that have made tr trillions of dollars. Uh, during this global pandemic. And, um, you know, there's not a lot of collective bargaining happening there. Uh, so strikes are essentially our last ditch effort to make some shit happen. And that's what we're seeing all across the country. And and we're approaching the general strike. I mean, go to paydayreport.com. That's an excellent site to, um, to keep up on what's going on. The last time I checked, which was yesterday afternoon, we were looking at over 220 strikes across this country. Uh, I've talked a lot about strikes. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm for it. I'm there, you know, fucking let's do this thing. Don't cross those picket lines. People don't cross those picket lines. So, uh, yeah. All right. We are wrapping today up. Thank you guys so much. This was a long one. This was, uh, I hope you guys had fun, uh, with this one. I know it's, it's kind of infuriating to see candidates like this, but I, but I wanted to really, you know, 
for, even for myself is is make sure I know I know my shit and it's good because I because there was a couple of things in there that I um, that I did get to learn myself, especially about the eighty four stuff. So uh, I hope you guys got uh, some information out of it. I hope that you guys um, will uh, enjoy and uh, these videos uh, tomorrow at noon. We'll be we'll be back live. Um, I'm gonna do. Uh, I have some lighter topics, less involved uh, topics to to cover. Um, but you guys are great. Um, there are some links in the video, uh, not in the video, but in the in the comment section and in the description of the video. Uh, one is for my new album that's coming out. That's uh, I'm, uh, you can pre-order it. It comes out June first. You can pre-order it for a dollar. Uh, that way, uh, everybody can get it. You can still pre-order it and uh nobody gets priced out uh, tickets to my virtual live stand-up comedy show are also available i'm doing them every single friday in june uh every single show is different there are a couple of flagship uh segments in it but every show is going to have a different theme different material we're going to talk about different subject matters we're going to address you know current events so kind of like uh, uh this thing here um but uh, yeah, we're gonna do. We're, there's a lot of stuff involved in that show. I'm having a really great time with it. Uh, I do illustrations. We look at videos like we did here. Uh, again, not as involved as this, but uh, yeah, uh, I I I liked it. I like how hey, this was fun. And the last thing is to to donate. Um, you can make a donation if you would like to. Uh, you can become a sustaining member if you would like to. And if you become a sustaining member, you get early access to my albums. You get free tickets to the virtual shows. You get unreleased material. Uh, you get a bunch of shit. So uh, those are the options there uh, for you if uh, if you are in a financial place to do so. Uh, but none of the financial things are, are necessary to enjoy these videos. It's very cool to have you guys in the comment section. It's very cool to that, that you guys interact with this stuff. Uh, I, I, I enjoy it. I hope you guys enjoy it too. Uh, but uh, till tomorrow, you guys, uh, thank you for tuning in. Stay safe and see you on the road.